this thing needs to be big this thing needs to needs to grow it, it uh, i think it'll have a good chance of like rewriting a lot of the rules that we have today and 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 really play a, an important role sort of challenging the status quo and i and i couldn't stop thinking about it and i decided to join ben and pablo on this journey and it's been it's been really fun lots of ups and downs lots of difficult times for sure but um but it's been overall a really nice positive experience and and, and something that i've really enjoyed um over the last you know over the last already six and some months years so six and six years and some months digital uh, value transfer has existed for a really long time okay um, you know it's decades old and 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 there's nothing wrong with that uh, the issue with with the way that it existed prior to bitcoin is that you relied on you relied on like partnerships or a company developing a technology and and putting it out there for their customers etc uh, and the and, and the big difference between that and and bitcoin is that now you have an open standard but but what what what's phenomenal about email is that it's just an open standard and anyone can connect to it and anyone in the world who wants to talk this open standard can benefit from this open standard and so you know you and i exchange emails and we don't need to be hosted on the same email provider we just have email providers that speak this standard and that's very powerful that's standards on technology are incredibly powerful when you look at you know the internet like a website the, the websites are built on open standards as well and um and and and, and 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 these open standards have been very very important and so bitcoin and a lot of these cryptocurrencies are built on these open standards that people can plug into and benefit from and so it's very different from a revolut because what it's being built on a standard where and so big bitcoin is sort of like larger than any company that's building on top of bitcoin you know and bitcoin has it's interesting because it has no cap table it has no cash burn it's just like this open standard on this open protocol that lives across the world uh on on on, on this distributed ledger that you were talking about just a minute ago mm -hmm. but it's the standard that's fascinating and so what and what we're seeing now is stuff getting built on top of these standards and that's sort of akin to websites getting built on top of the internet i think digitization is really changing the nature of that because some of these serving customers can be significantly cheaper right like you can be at a position where you are um or, or you can be in a position where you're like you know you don't have any physical branches people can access on your on, on, on their digital phone so it's just like the economics sort of like change uh, very significantly right um and then the cost of transaction uh, is significantly cheaper both for you as a as a business and for them as a as a as a consumer you know and so what we're seeing in my opinion is just again like just a reinvention of how financial services could work and 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 the impact of this technology on very important matters like financial inclusion you know uh, growing the financial inclusion in these countries mexico alone 120 some million people yeah. there's about there's roughly about 30 million bank accounts you're talking about tens of millions of people in the country who don't have access to like i'm not talking to you about like investment advice i'm talking about just basic wow. financial services like just the ability to store your wealth there's not a lot of repetitive work that happens at bits right and like when you look at i love this charlie chaplin movie modern times i'm not sure if you've ever seen it but he's like in this factory and he's just like it's just like you know talking about sort of industrialization and he's just like moving the range the same way the same way the same sure. way it's sure. sort of like that's crazy um but there's nothing there nothing like that goes on at bit so there's like very little if any repetitive work and so what that means is that the social capital of your team really matters a lot in basically moving yourself forward it's not like i can hire and train a hundred new people to move branches the same way and then i can basically like grow my output by a hundred times right like it, it this is fundamentally different i depend on people who are committed to our mission who want to rethink with me the status quo and who want to work together and making that a reality and so it's very 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 important to surround yourself with a phenomenal team of people 
and it needs to be an incredibly interdisciplinary team because when you think about crypto like the challenge is pretty big like it's not just you know package this slightly different like you know there's there's a lot of technology developments that need to happen there's a lot of like design elements that need to be solved for there's a lot of communication efforts that need to be done education etc so you really need like a very diverse team that can help you bridge all of these gaps across all of these different dimensions and can help you get to a place where you're basically like okay my value proposition is clear my clients are happy interacting with us and you're at a place where where you can continue to sort of like chase your dream and continue to grow and continue to do interesting stuff. And so when we think about like um, like our company values, we have we have three values as a company. Our first value is drive change. And so when we talk about drive change, what we're thinking is like, you know, we want people who are proactive, people who are creative. You know, they wanna they wanna look at the world at a different way and they wanna be creative people who are just hungry for like for growth hungry for a change hungry to 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 challenge the status quo our second value is what we call be human and so you know i we talked a little bit briefly about sort of like this discrimination and this and the issues of uh, of abuse in the financial services industry specifically in a place like we are and so like when when we think about being human is is both an internal ask and an external ask and so that's all about empathy and so how do we how do we how, how are we like how do we show empathy to our customers right. it's it's about respect you know um sure to each other in the company but also to our uh, our external uh, uh, stakeholders which are our clients yeah. and then humility and i think humility is this thing that i was just you know talking to you about just recently but but humility for us is important because you know, not because we are today on the forefront of technology means that we'll be able to stay there. And so if technology has taught anyone anything is that disruption is just an ongoing thing and it's never going to end. And so how do you stay humble um, and, and, and open to, to yourself being, you know, completely disruptive? And our last value is probably the value that um, most people in the company struggle with. Uh, we call it embrace your freedom. Okay. What and embrace your freedom. Sorry. What does it mean? Tell me more. Yeah. And so embrace when, when we think about embrace your freedom, like you know, Mexico, where we started, was well, traditionally a very conservative place when it comes to the relationship between an employee and their employer, and and we and, and we don't believe necessarily in that. Like we don't believe necessarily in having a set days of vacations or having like set hours where you should be able to work, uh, where you should be working. We kind of we kind of want to place that trust, that ownership, and that responsibility back into the team. You no, know? and 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 this and, and 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 like this this is like a big value for us because it permeates a lot of the decision making that we have as an organization so so for example like here, here's a good one we through covid we started to get into a, this rhythm of like just a lot of meetings over zoom or over hangouts or whatever and people were getting tired you were just in these back-to-back -back, like zoom meetings if you're a customer of coinbase and you have uh, dollars in your coinbase account you can't send those dollars to to like a third party, right? Like you you basically withdraw that to your bank account and then you send that money using your bank to somebody else. Um, with the partnerships that we've built and the regulatory the regulatory strategy that we followed as a, as a group, we actually can make payments to third parties. So someone who receives um, payment in crypto, for example, a freelancer that receives a payment in crypto on their Bitso account and turns it into pesos, can basically then use that to uh, pay the rent. They can use that to pay uh, their internet, pay that so utilities, uh, pay a friend, etc. On the platform, and um, and the number of payments have grown. And so this has been a very big focus for us, especially in the last like year and a half. Is how do we actually build a business that is not completely uh, subject like susceptible to these huge uh, crypto weather, right? Where, where basically when crypto is doing really, really well, um, you're doing really, really well. But if, like, but if crypto is doing bad in terms of price, you're doing really poorly. And if you actually track the volume of Bitso, like the, the, the swings in volume of Bitso, 
over the last, you know, like, uh, let's say 24 months since, since we had um, the, the peaks in, in January of 2018, our volume went down for sure. But especially in the last like seven months, as, as exchanges worldwide were losing volume, or many exchanges worldwide were losing money, volume, we were actually increasing our volume. Um, and this is because we've spent a long time finally building a remittance solution, uh, which you alluded to in the, in the introduction. But for, for us, this is very important because it goes back to crypto as a utility. It goes back to a business model where you don't necessarily need to depend on crypto prices increasing in order for your business to do very well. It's taking us a really, really, really long time. And we talked about remittances when you were uh, looking at this opportunity when you were uh, at DCG. And it took us basically, you know, half a decade to get to a place where we are finally capitalizing on the huge cross-border flow that exists between the U.S. and Mexico, which is about $33 billion, between 30 and $36 billion a year flows between the U.S. and Mexico. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we're finally at a place where we're starting to, like we've built a product, we've, we've built a product alongside with Ripple, and, and, and we're seeing significant amount of traction. And we see that we believe that this is just the beginning of something, right? Like this is the beginning of, of, of something a lot more exciting and interesting. But for us as a business, it's been great because you don't depend on that crypto weather. To, and, and, and the levers that you have, you know, as an organization are things that you can actually control as opposed to one of the most frustrating things about building an exchange is that you don't have those levers, right? Like sure. if the crypto price just starts going down, you don't have anything to pull. You may spend whatever you want to spend on marketing, but um, but if those prices continue to decline, it's going to be very, very hard to bring those volumes back. And if there's no volatility, it's, it's sort of difficult invested over the years a significant amount of time at Bitso in trying to figure out cross-border transactions. We've attended for years something called the International Money Transmitter Conferences, which happen in Miami most of the time, um, but in other places in the world. And you're just trying to understand sort of the, like the money transmission piece. Mm -hmm. And we've done that for a number of years, right? And we've built experiments and trials, and um, and, and we actually have a, a, a working product that works on top of Bitcoin that um, that has worked for the last two years, but we never really had um, like a lot of growth and a lot of like um, traction. At the same time, since the beginning of Bitso, so the, 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 so we the first thing we added in Bitso was a way to trade Bitcoin uh, with Mexican pesos, right? So that was sort of like first feature was a vanilla uh, exchange where you could fund Mexican pesos, fund Bitcoin, and people could trade uh, with each other. One of the very first thing, very very first things we did after that was we became what at the what at that time um, was called an, uh, a Ripple gateway. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know this, but Ripple has supported the issuance of assets on top of the Ripple ledger for a really long time. Sort mm -hmm. of like the same way that you can now issue assets on top of the Ethereum ledger, and you have things like, you know, uh, Tether and TrueUSD and whatnot. Um, you, 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 you actually were able to do that on, on the Ripple ledger for a really long time. There are other flows uh, that are not only the, the US to Mexico. And uh, so I can tell you a few things. Number one, I can tell you that not all the customers that we've been onboarding are money transmitters, like MoneyGram, mm -hmm. right? So like mm -hmm. there's other types of businesses that have a necessity to move money abroad and cross border and want to do it quickly and at a good rate that are becoming interested in this solution mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and, 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 and that have already transacted on the platform. So we already see those volumes. The, um, I can tell you that not all of them are, like not all the flows that we're seeing are only US to Mexico. Like we're starting to see things from other parts of, uh, like other jurisdictions. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, I can tell you for sure that you know the, the biggest flow and the biggest type of customer up to now is definitely the US to Mexico and it is definitely money transmitters like Monitor, right? Mm -hmm. um, we we've built like we we had our we've had a cross-border team at Bitso since 2016. 
and like well before we started exploring this possibility with Ripple. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned before, we had a or we have a product where, that allows you to do something similar with Bitcoin. I do have to say that the product that we've built in conjunction with Ripple is a lot better than anything we have built before. It has, uh, it's more intuitive, it has a nicer UI, it understands the customer pain points better. Um, uh, you know, the, the fact that XRP settles very quickly and that Bitcoin takes a long time to settle um, when, you, when what you're looking to do is reduce sort of like uh, volatility exposure, is, is, is a big pro of utilizing XRP over utilizing uh, Bitcoin for these for these sort of transactions. Sure, so we so at Quantcats we have two products. Um, one of them we offer for free, and it's a measurement product, and it allows people who have websites, and we call them publishers, to basically uh, get demographic information about the you know the audiences who visit their website. And, and Quantcast has kind of like um, differentiated itself um, because we tend to understand audiences fairly well. And specifically, like, we give you information on, you know, whether the segment of the population that's visiting your website is male, female, income level, um, education level, like, geographically where it's dispersed, where it's located. Um, and again, that service, we offer it for free. So if you guys have a website that you want to quantify, go to quantcast.com. And then the second uh, product is where we actually make money is we do targeted advertisement using this information. And, and, and specifically, the product that we have is called the lookalike models. And what we do is we find, you know, a segment of the population who has acquired a certain product and we've measured that. And then if you think about the Internet as, you know, like a little square like this, and you say, okay, this is the the segment of the this is the internet, and you have a little segment that has you know acquired some sort of product or has done something that you want to repeat. We basically look at what are the features that those people have been doing, um, and we try to you know build a larger segment of the population that exhibit the same set of features, and then target advertisement to them. And what we've actually found out is that it's extremely effective, and and um, and I mean people who are running campaigns with us are pretty happy. And, and, you know, in terms of like the technologies behind it, it's crazy. We participate in like real time auctions, which is we have processes that are making decisions on real time. Like within 100 milliseconds, we decide, you know, yes, we want to show this person an advertisement for this thing and we're willing to pay this much and whatnot. For, for me, and I think for, for most of us, technology is sort of this ever evolving um, thing, right? And when you look at the liquidity of something like true USD and Mexican pesos at Bitso versus the liquidity of um, XRP and Mexican pesos, like there's there's no comparison, right? Like we have significantly more depth in our XRP markets than we do in our true USD markets. I simply could not uh, support the amount of volume that we're seeing in our true USD books. And as I was sort of mentioning to you, like, um, you know, we, we, we're not the other side of the trade. Uh, our customers are the other side of the, of the trade for these, for these transactions. Um, I do think that, you know, this needs to be looked at and constantly reevaluated, right? Because mm -hmm. when, when you're going through whatever, whether it's XRP, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's Ether, whatever you want, um, you, you have sort of like an extra conversion that perhaps you don't need, right? And you, you're taking perhaps extra risk that perhaps you don't need. What I can tell you is that without a doubt, I would not be able to do these transactions. Like Pixel would not be able to do these transactions right now on any of our other, uh, in, in any of our other uh, measures. Like even if you wanted to use true USD, the the settlement of the of, of ether is slower than the settlement of xrp and if we wanted to use like uh and, and we're not supporting like a an, an asset on top of um of xr or on top of the ripple ledger but um but and but even if we wanted to we would we would need to build up liquidity i i do believe that as we progress like this industry uh, specifically for the case of cross-border, I think where we are today are the very beginnings of something incredibly exciting. 
Um, but I would, I you know, I think it would be foolish to think that this is going to be the end state. I think this mm-hmm. needs to continue to evolve, and I think stable coins uh, today, uh, you know, provide an alternative thing that you know perhaps didn't exist at the extent that we would have liked them to exist when we started to to to, to build this product. Right, like the only real stable coin back then was. Uh, tether and, and and tether is something that is difficult to is, is a difficult on ramp has had its own sort of set of uh, I don't know what you want to call them conspiracy theories whatnot and um, and, 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 and 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 when when I look at this problem like sometimes sometimes it's easy to think that everything is technology. Mm-hmm. But so one of the biggest learnings that I've had over the last, uh, you know, you know, five years building this, trying to build a cross-border product with crypto, is that the largest component is actually not tech. Like the largest component is convincing these highly regulated entities to do something with you, to open an account with you, to to get comfortable with utilizing crypto. Like th- th- those problems are a lot harder to fix, right? And uh, stable coins present um, a challenge there because, you know, we, we start to have these new um, stable coins where the aim is to make them incredibly transparent, where there's a lot of auditing going on, where there's a lot of like, you know, quote unquote, good people running, running these projects. But for a long time, it was a very opaque thing, right? And sometimes for these players, it's incredibly difficult to assess the risk of having a large operation that depends on assets where they don't fully understand um, how they're managed and, 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 and what potential risks could there be uh, behind them. To engage with them, to continue to provide assurance and, and, and to build a sound and good operation, right? Like where you're addressing those risks. and that's. That's ultimately, I think, what regulators uh, care about, and and I can tell you that, like, our, our our to call it like the dance with the regulators, our dance with the regulators has had, you know, um, all sorts of different phases. Like you just mentioned, one where there were th- th- there was some legislation that was passed that was going to make it very very difficult for a company like us to operate. But but we've also sort of acknowledged that the the the, the central like the, the the regulatory authorities like see an opportunity here right and they and they know that um that that, that they have concerns but they they want to remain optimistic i would say on this technology and um and 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 and, and i think we, we're starting to see a flip right like we started to talk about like central bank issued digital currencies and and we've had conversations with uh, regulators in mexico who have asked us that question like what do you guys think about this or that right um, and, and, and crypto as a tool for financial inclusion. So we've had regulators who've asked us about that and want, and, and want to explore that. And you know, one of the most exciting things that we're doing as a business is we're hoping to soon be running uh, a, a little, a, a very small trial, but a small trial in a community in Mexico, um, where we're going to be working with a few government agencies to basically do a trial on, on, on seeing if we can get customers to use um, like blockchain technology to transfer value. And I say blockchain technology because we don't necessarily want to give them Bitcoin because of the volatility of Bitcoin. But what we're thinking is like a, like a tokenized asset in some way, shape, or form. And, and, and the government wants to like just understand this a lot better, right? Like, ah, can, can, I can do this in a way where it's completely non-custodial and, um, and, and where customers can keep a control of their funds and they can still transact with each other and they want to explore these things and I think that's very, very important. The, the other thing that we've done um, as a business is, you know, the, the, the technology can be, can be difficult at times and it needs to be very properly studied. And what we have found is that when we look at sort of like legislation or regulation, um, not only in Latin America, but in many other places in the world, is that you really find regulation that's been sort of like tried to be molded in a way that fits the crypto space, where like 
it really it, it, you really need something new you really need something that is specific to crypto i think people completely underestimate the amount of utility that uh, customers in latam are actually utilizing for for, for for crypto like you and i are part of a few telegram groups where folks talk frequently about the narrative uh, like there's a narrative on, on some of these these chats and um and i'm just amazed how like 99 of those chats are dominated always by price action like that is the interesting thing it's it's, mm -hmm. it's speculation and um and and, and 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 whenever you see sort of these like little things of like oh wow like this technology is actually useful for someone or changing someone's life or whatever like there's very little interest um uh, on those things right like there's i wouldn't say there's no interest but but there's there's very little interest and um and i think the way in which crypto really becomes relevant for the world is through use cases right whether it's because it becomes a store of value or because it becomes a, a medium of exchange or because it provides a way to audit things more easily whatever it is but i think one of the things it, it, you, you we need to look at those um at those use cases and make sure that um that the technology becomes useful for folks and and i've always thought that the big challenge that the industry has is still regulatory i still think that regulations can come in and do significant damage to the for the future of this industry um you know we 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 get invited to the financial action task force uh private sector consultations we've been invited since the first one that was held uh, a few years ago and one of the most frustrating things for me attending those meetings is i've never been able to get the industry to act like I see the banking industry act in those same meetings. The mm -hmm. banking industry comes into those meetings and they have an agenda and every single bank representative is pushing that agenda. And in the crypto space, maybe it's because we're so young, maybe it's because like uh, as an industry, maybe it's because we're so um, disorganized still, maybe it's the nature of being the central, decentralized. I'm mm -hmm. not sure. But we're not great at lobbying, right? Um, uh, on the last meetings that we had, which were when we were like revising the travel rule, the regulators gave us an, an opportunity to come up with a joint statement as industry. Mm -hmm. And I could not get the industry to do that. We, we started an enormous uh, WhatsApp group with basically every single representative that was in those meetings. And uh, and we, we we just weren't able to do it, and um, and I was hoping that maybe 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 that was a result of like having very little time. But even after that, like we can't do it. Like the the financial action task force in four months is going to look at the evolution of the travel rule, and the industry has done very little. Like there's been a bunch of solutions that people have built and a bunch of stuff, but like. We, we we're not taking this stuff seriously as an industry mm -hmm. and um and i think that's going to come to the detriment and and and, and not even the, like some of the large players are sort of like getting together and like thinking about some potential solutions and that's great and 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 and, 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 and they have some potential solutions but um but the industry is, is is large right and you have players all over the world and and to me, it's surprising when I see a Japanese bank basically supporting a U.S. bank that's supporting a bank in, in Europe, but uh, but you don't see at all the same with the crypto companies. Like we we spit at each other and um, and just can't work. And what what you see basically on crypto Twitter when someone is you know um, very passionately talking about a specific project and hating a different project. Uh, you sort of see the same thing with like industry representatives and i'm not speaking specifically only about exchanges right like i'm talking about uh, you know wallets non-custodial wallets exchanges um you know blockchain analysis providers like all the we, we we come with across to these very important set of policy of, of like global policy makers as like a set of kids running around like a set of chickens running around with their heads cut off and i think that's really bad if i could change one thing 
that would be it. Better coordination with the industry where we can come up with joint positions to lobby them together to help the, the, the these, these global policy pressures that we're starting to receive um, as an industry.